This episode is brought to you by the following patrons. Jeff, O oh Them Bones, Awesome Possum Blossom, Amy, Dylan, William, Brandon, Dave, Scott, Tristan, Kate, Sasha, Isaac, Ori, Karoon, Eddie, Nick B, and Chris. And Chris and the rest of the patrons want you to know that you're loved, you are listened to, and you are a valued member of this awesome horror virgin community. I think my favorite part of this movie is Mel Gibson pretending like he doesn't know how to swear at people till they cry. <laughs> I think the aliens left the planet at the end because one of them knocked somebody up and they all had to pull out. <laughs> 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 Thank you for tuning into Horror Virgin. I'm Paige. I'm Mikey. And I'm your Horror Virgin Todd, which means I don't like scary movies, but you guys make me watch them. And this week, the listeners made me watch the 2002 Signs. Signs. Was this the first time you guys had seen Signs? Actually, yes. And really? uh, I, I had gone the last almost 20 years thinking I had seen this movie at some point. <laughs> Uh, only wow. to watch it and then be like, oh, no, I, I never saw this. I must have just like <laughs> pieced pieces of this together from because it was a pop culture phenomenon. Yes. I must have just absorbed enough of it to think that I saw it because we got like I got like 10, 15 minutes into this movie and I texted you guys. and I was like, man, I haven't seen this in like over 15 years. So it's like I'm watching it for the first time. And then the longer I watched it, I was like. No, I think I am watching this for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mikey, had you seen it before? Yeah, I saw it in theaters when it came out. Yeah, so did I. Surprising. Yeah. I mean, this was uh, M. Night. He went six cents, Unbreakable, and this. And this yeah. was like his biggest name cast. I think this is his... I think this is a well-directed movie, too. and I, and, But it, it just goes downhill after this. But yes. I, I remember liking it, but didn't like it for the water, the 70% water, and like why they would yeah. do that. Uh, but I have thoughts on it now. I have a perspective that the video games and reading science fiction has really brought to my life. That when I rewatched it today, it made more sense than when I saw it in theaters. Oh, okay. I, I super don't love the ending. I really don't like the ending either, Paige, but I bet for very different reasons than you don't like it. I don't give a shit about the water stuff. Cool. I'm on board. That's fine. I just did not like the end for other reasons, but we'll get to it when we get there. Is it because they set the asthmatic child down in a bunch of grass? Because that was triggering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That grass is going to kill the shit out of that kid. <laughs> no, I, I guess we'll get to it more when we get to the end. I feel like it has a huge Structure, structural problem. And, oh, fair and enough. I really don't like it. Yeah. When I saw this, I went with my older brother Brandon to see this movie in the theaters. I don't remember why I agreed to go, but I do remember not watching the majority of it. Like, <laughs> you just threw your hands? <laughs> not even through my hands, Paige. I would like cover my eyes and put my thumbs in my ear holes so I couldn't <laughs> even hear what was, and I would have to move my thumbs so they would make a little bit of sound so I couldn't hear anything. Jeez. Like no joke, all the jump scares in this movie that Natalie forced me to watch while we watched this late last night, I did not know were coming. Like I had no idea because oh I God. had not seen them before. <laughs> This movie scared the shit out of me on a second rewatch because I didn't watch it the first time, really. I will say, I think this movie's like 90% great, like the atmospheric stuff going on and those like jump scares uh, moving up. And then I do think it falls apart at the end with showing the monster and all that stuff. Or or like the, it just kind of jumps to like they've left the planet, which I, I get it. But that that's my biggest issue. So we'll talk about it when we get to the end. But that that is my biggest issue is they've just left the planet. So we we've taken away the actual like stakes of the movie. I think that scene where they watch the home footage on TV is like one of the I, I remember that scared the Jesus out of me in the theaters. I hated it a lot. I feel like you see too much of the monster and it ruins it for me completely. This movie's a one for me. I not, oh, not Jesus. A, wow. Oh. No, I, I gave it. It was more than one today. This is technically a first watch for me. Not a single jump scare got me. Oh my I god! I hated that you could see the monster when the hand grabs uh, the Colkin kid at the end. Oh that my god! You. I, I literally said, oh. "Rad." <laughs> Like I oh, just, what? <laughs> nothing. But then here's the thing. I do think it's well directed. I think the emotional core of the story is fantastic. Same. Can cannot argue. Yeah. I feel like from a scare and a dread standpoint, you could ratchet this shit way up. And this movie could be 
way fucking scarier than it is. I will tell you, one of the scariest movies I've ever seen is an alien in movie it's that fourth kind see okay that got listed in the facebook group as and it didn't get voted on for listener requests i hate that movie i've never mentioned it before because i didn't want them to vote on it and maybe watch it that movie scared the shit out of me i was very honest in the group i saw that trailer and didn't sleep for a night what? i've never seen the movie because the trailer oh, scared me hate, so I fucking it. bad i hate it oh my god i don't want to see this movie at all in particular, alien ab abduction and invasion stories do scare me because I am one of those people that assumes they'll be hostile every time. But this one, I was like, this gets an A plus for character development and emotional realism within a story. Mm -hmm. And it gets an F on dread for me. I, I predicted most of this movie from the first few scenes. Oh, man. I did not. The jump scares really scared me. I mean, even some scares that probably weren't jump scares, but still <laughs> like, like the phone ringing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, though. But yes, yes, that scared yeah. me. <laughs> I, I, I put it in my notes. I was like, I bet this scared the shit out of yeah, Todd. No joke. I watched this last night. Natalie made it for like 30 minutes and fell asleep. And then I'm watching it trying not to move or make too much noise as she's sleeping. And it's like, how do you sleep through this? Like, it's scaring the shit out of me. I just forgot how good the chemistry is from with the family. The, the family chemistry and, like I said, the emotional center of the movie, fantastic. We spend so much time with their family and their interpersonal drama. This movie made me cry a lot, but I wasn't scared. This movie gives me, like, hereditary vibes because it is a like shadow into the life of a family going through immense grief. Yeah. And I like that aspect of it. There are some really cool things that they do in this movie when they're not showing the monster. And I actually noted them because I was like, I want more of this yeah. and less of the video of the monster walking across the street. Although that scared the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like bad CG. What's, this, what's scary about that? It did in 2002. It looked good. I, that it's it was scary in two thousand two in the Thank theater. Thank you. I'll Mike. tell you. <laughs> I didn't see it in two thousand two, but when I saw it last night, it scared the shit out of me. But Paige, let's get into this movie so we can talk about it. Let's do it. So we open on the credits, and the score starts like halfway through the credits, like it <sighs> like builds and then immediately starts, which is real strange but it is a very eerie score i think the music in this movie is actually done pretty well yeah the music is killer the credits are horrible they're way way too long and it's just names on the screen there is no more boring credits than this oh todd we've seen plenty boring credits than this i mean maybe but these are up there i had time to notice that tak fujimoto was the director of photography on this and i was like oh he's done a ton of great stuff and i'm like Wait a second, these are the credits of a, of a horror movie. Like, what am I doing? So I was actually going to point out, like, this movie is excellently shot. Yeah. And it's largely because of him. But he's done a lot of other things, like Silence of the Lambs, he did The Sixth Sense. He's an amazing director of photography. But that's how boring these credits were. Is I was yeah. like, oh, <laughs> a person I know on the crew. <laughs> like, that's <laughs> so little to pay attention to. We open on a backyard playground and we're kind of panning through the house. We see a family photo and then we see Mel Gibson wake up with a start. He goes to his daughter's room and he stands outside her door. He doesn't wake her, wake her up yet. I think he thinks yeah. she's still asleep. He goes to the bathroom. This shot when he's in the bathroom, this one shot tells you everything you need to know about Mel Gibson as a man. And I love that about the way Tak does his shots. Because in this scene, you can see he's in there brushing his teeth. But on the wall, you see the outline of what used to be a cross. Yeah. And yeah. It, like it's clear that there was a cross there and that it has ta been taken down. So you immediately know that he was a man of faith that has lost his faith completely. Yeah. I love that shot. So he hears her screams. He bursts into her room. She's not there. The scream also wakes up Joaquin Phoenix, who is living above the garage. Yeah. They both run outside through the cornfield where they find her standing ominously in the cornfield. There isn't a way to stand in a cornfield that's not ominous, though. That's true. You ever been to a corn maze? They're terrifying. Wait, have you guys done <laughs> Children of the Corn? No. No. <gasps> <gasps> it's terrible in the best way. We should totally do Children of the Corn. Yeah, I agree. I don't. It's not terrible. <laughs> anyway, so she says, are you in my dream too? And he says, this is not a dream. And he hears his son, Morgan, and he follows Morgan through the corn. And Morgan says, the dogs are barking. It woke us up. And he says, are you hurt? And then Morgan says, I think God did it. And he says, did what? 
and he turns Mel Gibson's head towards the direction of his gaze. Mel Gibson walks forward where he steps into a gigantic crop circle. Yeah. The camera pulls back to reveal that it's a large, complicated pattern, not just a single circle. As a nerd for the paranormal. <laughs> you might say paranormal. <laughs> Nailed it. I hate that they used crop circles because it's one of the things that's so demonstrably fake. Like there's never really been a real crop circle. <laughs> And so the fact that they're like, I know it was fake 20 years ago, but this time it's real. And I'm like, why would it be real this time? Why would we have somehow faked the thing that aliens would then use as a real thing? Within the world of this movie, crop circles are fake because they do say that a yeah, bunch of times. And they talk about the way that people make crop circles with the rope and the like planks and everything. And they basically are like, yeah, people faked a bunch of these 20 years ago, but, you know, we haven't seen any since. Or did they? They did. Like, specifically they did. And this movie claims that they did. Yeah, this movie says that they did. So why, then, would real aliens be doing the same thing that we were faking? But what if those people accidentally wrote, please come here, in a crop circle accidentally? If that had been part of this movie... <laughs> Now I'm here for it. Oh, I am here for people <laughs> accidentally calling aliens. But in order for them to see the damn crop circles, they would have had to already be here. You're just like trusting the lamestream media, okay? Oh, God. I was watching on Newsmax, and they told me that... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if aliens do come, half the people are going to refuse to believe they're here. Like, humanity's way worse than we thought, and everything makes sense in movies now. No, here's the thing. <laughs> I fully accept that people would not believe signs of aliens if they saw them. I fully accept that. That's not the problem I have. The problem that I have is that the signs they're using are the ones we used to fake alien landings that this movie claims were fake. Paige, I do get your point. Your problem is not that they use crop circles so much. It's more that they disprove in this movie that crop circles were a thing aliens would use. Yes. And then aliens actually do use them in this world. Exactly. Well, but what if they knew that we use them and disprove them and then that made them use them again because they're like, they're just going to think it's a prank. Mikey, I have a question. So are you suggesting that the way they made these crop circles was that they just got out of their alien ship with boards and rope and made them like we make them? Yeah, they're like, these stupid idiots aren't even going to realize that we're aliens. <laughs> so what you're saying that this invasion of the world is like a college prank to them? I mean, they did leave like three people in a cornfield for a week. <laughs> I mean, like they aren't like the best. Oh, my God. <laughs> Think about it. It doesn't make sense within the movie. I agree, Paige. Had they said, yes, we never really found out what the original crop circle came from. There were a lot of copycats after that. But we never really know where this came from to begin with. Right. And then, you know, but now it's starting to show up all over the world. That's scarier to me than these things were scientifically disproven. And they're definitely not a thing that mean aliens. But it might mean aliens this time. Yes. And here's the only thing you would have had to do <laughs> is a Google search by the sun. That's all you needed. You just need one tiny scene of the sun being like the one in our field looks like this one and they've never been able to prove who did it. Yeah. This is also 2002 though, Paige. So it would have been like an ask Jeeves, but yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it would have been like, he didn't have high speed internet on the farm. He may have not had internet he, on the farm. They gave him a book about aliens. <laughs> it's gonna be in the damn book. <laughs> they literally gave him the answers and he's still like, yeah, it turns out all crop circles were fake. The, you know, like he's holding Google of the time. Yeah. And they still don't give him two lines to explain away a huge plot hole that apparently no one has commented on this whole time. Yeah, we get it, Paige. We get it. <sighs> I, and honestly, I completely agree with you. That little fix would have made it better. I suspended disbelief, so I just sailed past all this. I can't. I can't. So we get like a little Chiron at the bottom. This is Bucks County, Pennsylvania, right. 40 miles outside Philadelphia. And we get a close on Mel Gibson calling to see if it was the local boys messing around. And he finds out that they were at the movies. They weren't out last night. And whoever is on the other side of the phone is sure. Yeah, but 
they weren't out. I mean, they weren't in. They were out. They went to the movies at least, so they were still going. They were still out. So you're saying that the crop circles could still be fake, Mikey? <laughs> I'm saying that the brothers were in on it. At that point, if I was Mel Gibson, I'd have been like, okay, so it could have been them. Yeah. yeah. Because if I was pulling pranks like I did in high school, I would occasionally go to a movie theater, buy a movie ticket, and not go to that movie, but to prove I had an alibi if I needed one. Yeah. Uh, did you guys not do that? Is that just I would I would just go to the movies anyway and do whatever I was gonna do afterwards. Oh no, I had to be home at a certain time. Yeah. Oh, I did not have a curfew. Yeah, my parents loved me, so they wanted to make sure I was safe. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so over his shoulder you see his two children with their dog who does not look well. No. And we reveal that the dog peed on the floor and they think the dog is sick. And he says he's going to call the doctor. He'll know what to do. And they say that the doctor's not a veterinarian, which this is one of those things that does not pay off until so late in the movie that you forget about it by the time it actually pays off. The veterinarian is the guy who ran over their mom. Yes, exactly. But you don't find that out until an hour from now. Yeah. But it's a cool detail. It is a cool detail. And honestly, they don't really explain that to you. That's one of those things they show, don't tell. Yeah. So like if you're not super paying attention, you don't notice that. I feel like it sort of does pay off pretty quickly because then the sheriff who comes over, she's talking about how a lot of animals are sort of losing their minds. I mean, the, the part that I didn't think paid off is why he wouldn't call the vet. Right. Why he was only calling the doctor. But yes, as far as like animals, she comes over and is just like, yeah, a lot of animals have been acting weird. And she describes the symptoms that this dog exactly has. They go to talk outside. And while they're doing that, his son, Morgan, is barbecuing. And that kid is too young to be barbecuing, I think, maybe? This is a farm page where children are men and men are really old. <laughs> I'm honestly just thinking in terms of can he reach the barbecue? Oh, he's got like a milk crate or whatever. It's farm life. He's probably milking the cows and shit, you know. Yeah, he's on an apple box. He's doing fine. I mean, he's got that little poker thing he kills his dog with later. He's doing fine. Yeah, cause, and literally seconds later, he ends up killing that dog. They also never really pay off Abigail Breslin's tick about thinking all the water's contaminated. What do you mean they never pay it off? I mean, they talk about it the whole time but it really only serves to set glasses around the room that we're going to use in the final act like Chekhov's water glasses yeah that's why that's why she was doing that I, I mean we established that she might be psychic which is a strange aside I mean she's not psychic she just has very vivid dreams God told her to put water out and that it was poison and that's why she put water out. At one point they say that the water thing is a tick but not a tick but that's the only explanation we get that she's just weird about it and I think if the water thing was the only weird thing I'd be a little more like okay that's her thing whatever Yeah. but the fact that she's got the water thing and then she's also like she's an oracle yeah well because when he finds her in the cornfield she's like am I still dreaming and he's like no you're not this is real and then later she almost predicts her brother's near-death experience. So she tells him she doesn't want him to die, and then later, when he's having the asthma attack, she says, I dreamed this. Yeah, I dreamed this. This is what happened in my dream. But that's just like deja vu. That happens, man. Do you guys not have deja vu like that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's all that was. All I'm saying is that it's an extra layer of weird in a movie that can't even seem to manage its first layer of weird. Oh, it's like Todd. Oh, it's multiple layers <laughs> and all of them are weird. Thank you, Mikey. And, and not managed well. <laughs> there you everyone. <laughs> anyway, so while he's barbecuing, she's claiming the water's contaminated, but she feeds it to the dog anyway. And the dog growls at the bowl of water. I need an explanation for why the dog is averse to water, unless it's a thing. I don't think the dog's averse to water. I think the dog's averse to people and it, it feels like there's a predator around and it's tied down. It doesn't want to be tied down. It wants to run away. So it's very aggressive. It's just being aggressive towards those two kids. Anyway, uh, we cut out into the cornfield where Mel Gibson and the police officer are talking about like what kind of machine or what kind of people could bend corn stalks over without breaking it. Yeah, he's like, there's no way this could be the brothers. Like, this is too perfect to be those kids in the area or whatever. Right. In this world, it establishes that crop circles have been done before. So, like, just believe that they've been done to you. Well, and the one sticking point that they have is that no one ever does them in corn. They do them in wheat. And the reason that happens is because wheat is lower and it's easier to compress with just the uh -huh. weight of a person doing it. So it would take... It would be much harder to do in corn 
That is real. But then on the news, we see a bunch of them in wheat, so it doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> anyway, so this is where she tells him that a lot of the animals have been acting violent and kind of funny, almost yeah. like they smell a predator. And he asks her to stop calling him father. And she says, why? And then he just says, I don't hear my children. Yeah. So he races back to his kids where we find out that Morgan, his son, has killed the dog. Oh, this is brutal, man. This is so Which sad is to me. so brutal. And it's because the dog was going to try and kill the little sister. Oh, yeah. It's not like he just hauled off and murdered it. No, like he was protecting yeah. his little sister. They yeah. may have been slowly abusing the dog and that's why the dog attacked them. I don't think that is the case, but that's a hot take. I mean, <laughs> here's the thing. In watching this, I read this as something about the dog's exposure to the aliens has made him averse to water as well and violent and almost like a thing or like he was poisoned and that's why he's reacting this way okay i think that would have been a more interesting movie anyway he's really broken up about it even though it is self-defense it is super sad yeah and one of the things i noticed at this point so abigail breslin the little girl Bo is sitting cross-legged on like their little playhouse and she's so small that Mel Gibson goes over to pick her up and he could place his hands on her hips and just like pick her up like a basketball. She's yeah. like so tiny, um, but he carries her inside. Uh, that night he wakes up and Abigail's standing right in front of him. And she says, there's a monster outside my room. Can I have a glass of water? The one next to my bed tastes old. And he walks her back to her bed and puts her brother back in bed, who's kind of rolled out of bed. And he asks her, what are you thinking about? And she says, why do you talk to mom when you're by yourself? Now, for a hot second, because the police officer didn't talk to anyone else at the house, for a hot second, I was like, <laughs> is that the mom? <laughs> that would have been a crazy, like, sixth sense twist right there. Are we, well, because it's M. Night Shyamalan, I was like, are, are we about to solve this mystery with a ghost? <laughs> um, but no, she talks to other people. This part made me super sad, though. He says, it makes me feel better. And yeah. then she says, does she ever answer back? And he says, no. And she says, she never answers me either. Yeah, Ugh. It's extremely sad. It's almost like in Conjuring 2 when they're asked the Ouija board when their dad's coming home from buying cigarettes. <laughs> he says, I do declare. I do not declare. not coming back. <laughs> this makes me real sad just because that little girl is young enough that she may not really have a full comprehension of what death actually is. Yeah. It just makes me real sad. It is sad. As he's looking out her window, he sees something or someone on the roof. Oh my God, this scared the shit out of me. And it does <laughs> not look like it's a person. It looks like an alien. Here's my monster movie take. This is great. Yeah. This is one of the places where they really do it great because it's enough of an outline that you're like, maybe it's a person, maybe it's something else. I don't know. It's not close enough for me to be bothered by the CG. It's shadowy enough that it could be a person. This is good. Yeah, it scared the sh Get out of me. And they think it's the local boys. I mean, he wakes up Joaquin Phoenix, but they think it's the local boys. And they decide that they're going to try and scare them away by acting crazy. And they're like, yeah, you got to run around and curse. And Mel Gibson says it won't be convincing. And I was like, oh, imagine a world where Mel Gibson doesn't curse. Like, imagine. <laughs> I honestly want someone to take this scene where, like, Joaquin Phoenix is like, just run around cursing. It's like, I can't curse. And he's like, well, you're not really cursing. You're like playing. You're like play acting, right? It's like for the show of it, right? And then, like, he, like, amps him up to do it. And then when he runs outside and they go in opposite directions, instead of, like, him saying, I am enraged with anger or whatever he I says. I am losing my mind. Yeah. <laughs> They just drop in that phone call to his uh, significant other, whoever he called that time. Yeah. Oh, no. oh, there's a recording of one of his arrests, which is pretty great. The what? That's the one where he calls somebody sugar tits. It's oh my god, so great. But yeah, they should just drop in that audio and then just call a day. Yeah. This is a funny part though. Him trying to be intimidating. Yeah. I am insane with anger. Oh, I love how they juxtapose that to Joaquin, like running around. Because he's like, I am insane with anger. Then it cuts to Joaquin Phoenix and he's like, I'll fucking murder all of you motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah. like, he's just like losing his shit. I love that. Can we talk about how Joaquin Phoenix kills it in this movie? Like he is pitch perfect. He's great in almost every movie. I'm going to say no one is bad in this movie. All of the acting is great. Yeah. Except for M. Night. 
<laughs> All the actors in this movie do a great job. The director's not so much, Mikey. <laughs> well, especially because this role is such a huge part. It's not just like a bit part. Like, it factors into the plot of the movie. I mean, he killed their mom. But also, he's the one who figures out how to defeat the aliens somehow and traps one that we don't get to see that he just kind of like passively is like, oh yeah, by the way, I trapped one in the pantry. Bye. Like, yeah, bye. I'm going to the lake. Have a fun bye. weekend. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so they run around the house screaming and they hear a noise behind them, the swing, and then the corn is moving. So it's literally whatever it was was so fast they didn't even really get to see it. It got the jump on them and it's gone before they have a chance to do anything. I mean, this is really tense, though. Like, they run around the house, they hear it go up on the roof, and they go, oh, my God, they got up on the roof, which is super scary in and of itself because it is like a tall roof that it just jumped mm -hmm. onto. And then it jumps over them, I guess, and then runs through the swing set into the corn? Yeah. That's terrifying. That is scary. Yeah. The next morning, the police officer's back, and she's taking notes from Morgan, and she tells him that Bo's baby monitor could be a one-way walkie-talkie until somebody gets you one from the station, basically implying that she's going to eventually get him a walkie-talkie. That's your taxpayer dollars being wasted right there. Oh, yeah, her giving a, a used walkie-talkie to a child who's mm -hmm. interested, yeah. <laughs> but he also asks Bo, his daughter, to turn down the TV until the officer leaves, and he's kind of upset that she keeps leaving glasses of water around. I love that because he goes and picks up like three glasses of water and then looks over and sees three more like on another <laughs> table. Yeah. And then he doesn't even take the three that he picked up like to the kitchen. He just puts them down. And he's like, I've lost this war. I'm not even going to fight this battle. And then he just <laughs> leaves them and goes away. How many glasses do they own as a family? Too many. I don't know, but I... I had a problem with this, especially as a teenager, where I would bring drinks to my room and then forget all the cups there. <laughs> and it used to drive my mom nuts. And every once in a while, she would just come in and raid my bedroom for glasses. <laughs> so I understand that. Uh, I don't understand her, her weird pickiness about water, but whatever. So the police officers interviewing Joaquin Phoenix. And this is where we find out that he's Mel Gibson's brother, although I had kind of inferred that already. Yeah. And we find out that he moved there after his wife died. After Mel Gibson's wife died, yeah. yeah. And he's trying to give a description of what they saw last night, but it was very dark. And the police officer is like, so were they tall? Were they not? Was it male, female, anything? Like, do you know anything? And he basically is like, well, I don't think it was a girl because it was super fast. And she's like, Ahem, some scary lady who was very big and fast ruffled some feathers at the diner the other week. So don't count it out yeah it could be any of us right it was a weird conversation all around it was right well and, and i think what she's just basically trying to get at is that like you don't know what you saw so don't let your mind get carried away from you think about what you actually saw and try not to immediately jump to what your fear is telling you. And honestly, I think it's good for law enforcement to not try and like have the person they're interviewing, give them the suspect they're thinking about. Right. And just give them a real ID of who they think it is. hundred percent. Right. God honest. She's, she is a female sheriff. So she is probably fully aware of people's implicit bias and it probably makes her a better sheriff. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. You're probably right. Diversity on police force. Is, is a good thing. Yeah. It is. I, I actually think as far as law enforcement officers in movies go, she's pretty good because she takes in evidence and then does research and then acts on it. Yeah. As opposed to just like, eh, it's nothing. She, you know, looks at the circles. She, you know, talks to somebody else at a different farm and she's just like, I don't know what this means, but I'm going to check on it. In the meantime, you and your kids have been through a lot. So maybe let's not add aliens to the list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also at this point, like there's no evidence of aliens. Like even the movie is saying crop circles are not even close to evidence of aliens. So don't even worry about that. We've had the one jump scare where the thing was on the roof and that's it. And that could easily be explained as like a prank by one of these kids, right? Yeah, and if let's say there's multiples of them, so what they're perceiving as something jumping over them or running away is actually one that's still on the roof and then another one running behind them. Absolutely, yeah. Now, this is where 
Bo basically says, hey, I can't find the remote. And he says, well, just change it on the TV. And she says, but it's the same show on every station. Yeah, she's like, I did that. But like the same shows on every channel. And then they look up like, wait, that happened last year. And it was a national <laughs> tragedy. Oh, no. That's what I thought of, too. I though. know. I remembered that day and I remembered flipping through the channels and it was just the same. That was so crazy. I'm going to tell you, though, one of the only things that's ever felt like that is the Capitol riots. Like everyone yep. had that on TV. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that was on my phone scrolling through Twitter. It was just constant live feed. Yep. Every TV channel. There's people had the news pulled up everywhere because I was at work and I drove home and I stopped and like it was everywhere. It, and it has not happened since 9-11 like that. I had not yeah. seen things. Yeah. Anyway, so what they're showing is crop circles all over the world and yeah. what the news is presenting because the news at this point says 20 years ago, crop circles were proven to be fake. Yeah. So it establishes them as fake. So what it basically is implying is that this is an elaborate interconnected hoax, like a flash mob for crop circles. But they basically settle on either this is the most elaborate hoax or it's real. Yeah. And this is where the police officer basically says, hey, I did some research after I saw your crops and I've seen that people can do this overnight. It yeah. can be done. She even says it would take like two or three guys to do this size crop circle overnight. Yeah. Okay. I have a crop circle theory. Okay. okay. Let's think of it like as an intelligent species. Why would you do this? Okay. Okay. Well, they tell us why they do it in the movie. No, 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 no. I, that's what that's what the people thought. But I think the spacecraft have their own navigation equipment. This is what we do when we get bored. So these crop circles are probably like, for a good time, call Snarlack or, <laughs> or like just a giant alien dick just painted on a crop. It's probably just bullshit because that's the only reason they would do it probably. That makes equally as much sense as crop circles in this film. Well, I guess, yeah, they are asking us to believe that they have equipment that can get them across the universe, but when they get to a planet, they need to draw in our crop to know where they are they need to they need to know where pennsylvania is <laughs> it's totally them <laughs> dropping off the scouts and then like the pilot being like you know what i'm gonna do here i'm gonna draw a snark right here and it's gonna be fucking hilarious can i just say i really love mikey's made up alien words i think they're <laughs> great anyway she basically is like i know that two to three people can do this overnight but there are so many of them now that's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people all working together to do this in a matter of hours and that is unlikely yeah so she's gonna go back to the station and have some coffee and basically make some calls and figure out if there's any other around. Oh my God. I just thought of something. That one in the pantry that gets his like fingers cut off, he's probably like walking back and he's like, those assholes, they dropped me off at this place. They put that I have a small dick in a cr <laughs> like they wrote that <laughs> on the crop. ground and I'm trapped in a pantry. No, that one got left. He was left yeah. behind. He is straight up from the Left Behind series. He's Flirk Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah come on if you're a scout for an alien army and like you get trapped in a pantry if i was your commanding officer i'd leave you behind yeah i'd be like so long red shirts <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like that pantry was barred shut with stuff right. there wasn't yeah, even right. a chair in front of it it was a doorknob he got bested by a doorknob there's a table tilted up to that door. oh is there okay okay yeah but they definitely were just like have fun on rigel seven bye <laughs> <laughs> Flirk Cameron's such a dick. Let's just leave him. We didn't want to separate you from your finger. Uh. <laughs> and you guys know, because of other alien-based movies, without his fingers, he can't phone home. He's hailing us. Should we answer it? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> That's why I wrote, fuck you, Eric, in the crop. Right there. <laughs> he probably had to dial it with his dick because he lost his fingers. <laughs> okay, now I'm just thinking of how E.T. calls phone sex lines. But it, only his <laughs> dick glows, not his heart. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the scene where the officer basically recommends that he kind of take his family out, get some, you know, distance from it, turn off the TV, go into town. It's a really good idea. I mean, hey, you're going through a rough time anyway because you're the mom just died. You know, your wife, their mom. Yeah. And now they're going through a stressful time where things are weird everywhere all of a sudden. So, yeah, mm -hmm. just try and get their mind off of it. It's really good advice. Yeah. And they end up having to turn off the radio because yeah. it's all over the radio, too. They go into town and he gives the kids book money. They go to the bookstore and the kid deliberately buys a book on extraterrestrials, which the 
people working in the bookstore say is for city people. Yeah. Which is really funny. I thought it was really funny, too. I really like the bookstore owner, the guy. I assume they both yes. owned it, like they were married. Uh -huh. But, like, the guy who's like, they're just trying to sell soda. Like, like that was the whole plot behind it. It's viral marketing. Yeah, for <laughs> soda. Not, not even, like, Pepsi or Coke. Just nondescript soda. Even when Rory, the kid, Morgan, I think is his name, is looking at the book, you hear him, like, go... 13 and he's like counting the number of commercials he's seen yes and they show the very generic soda commercial it's a shasta commercial that's the funniest <laughs> part it is an insane like that would never be whatever man i thought that that was hilarious i i bet that was a placeholder for product placement they didn't get because it's like soda, soda, soda de soda. Who doesn't love soda? Like, it's so <laughs> ridiculous. And they say soda where they should be saying the brand name of the soda. Well, and also, it is clearly a can of Shasta, but her hand is covering the yes. label. Yeah. <laughs> Which is very funny. The props department even phoned it in. <laughs> <laughs> so they're basically chalking it up to copycats so again the yeah. movie's reinforcing him as fake yeah then we cut to the pharmacy where mel gibson is trying to pick up his son's asthma medicine and the pharmacy tech is basically like i need like i'm gonna spill my whole feelings to you and confession and everything as if you're a priest, which is, again, there's some confusion about what denomination of Christianity is. If he's he Episcopalian, is. they're not doing confession. And if he's Catholic, he's not necessarily wearing the collar. Maybe he is. Catholic priests would wear the collar, but he would not have a wife and kids That's if he was true. a Catholic yes. priest. That's what made Episcopalians Episcopalians. Yeah. So we're looking for anyone out there who knows of a priest that wears a collar, but also is allowed to have sex. But also also does confession yeah i thought confession was like a singular catholic it is thing. as far as i know i mean like i've been to a hell of a lot of of non-denominational and denominational churches i've never seen it except in catholicism so i but i may be wrong i will say that people if you're like a counselor or a mental health person or like a in the clergy people do overshare with you very quickly yes. yeah and again one or two lines could be tweaked. The same conversation happens and it would still be just as funny. You just don't have her use the word confession. Yeah, it's her listing out the number of times she swears and things like that. That I'm like, this is confession, but like. Well, I think she even refers to it as she needs a confession. Yeah. And he doesn't he doesn't say that, hey, that's not even my religion, man. Yeah. Uh, let alone that he's not even a father anymore. But I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe she just like forces him into the situation and because he is seen that way in the community as, as like a. A, yeah. You know, a, yeah. a pastor or a priest or whatever that he, he's just like the go to person to overshare with. Right, Mikey? Right. It's like right. when I go to like uh, a barbecue and I'm like drinking a beer and someone sits down and they're like, Mike, uh, you like deal. You're like a therapy guy. Like, let me tell you about like this girl I'm dating's issues. What, like, what do you think about this? <laughs> and I'm like. I just want to enjoy my time. I, I just want to enjoy my time here. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> no, and, like, yeah. and much like you would say in that situation, what he should say is, listen, I'm a father, but I'm not your father. <laughs> <laughs> I do love this scene, though. And I love this actress. Did you guys recognize who this is? Yes, yes. Yes. I love her. Yeah. I didn't know who she was until you, Mikey, told me to watch the show run. And I think she's I love great. That show. Yeah. She's amazing. She was one of my favorite subplots on New Girl that they just immediately abandoned but it was so so great where she played like a chubby girl that schmidt dated in college and yes, they end up dating yes. again and her whole thing is like i love me so i don't care i don't yeah. need to be some skinny model and it starts to kind of make him question his relationship with his self-esteem and then they just completely abandon it and he ends up back with cc and it made me so angry when i was watching it yeah i pretty much stopped watching the show at that point i was just <laughs> like fuck this her name is Merritt weaver she's yeah. great but i also love in this where she's like hey is douchebag a curse and he goes i guess it <laughs> depends on how you use it in the sentence so she right. says, 
hey, Johnny, you're a douchebag for making out with Christina or whatever. And he goes, yeah, that that's a curse. And then she goes, okay, well, then I cursed 78 times, not 31 times or whatever. The funniest part is when he goes back into the show and he's like, never hang out with Mary <laughs> yes, Stein again. Absolutely. He literally goes in there and says, I don't want you hanging out with Tracy Abernathy ever again. So he, <laughs> yeah. like, he uses her full name. He's like, I, I got to make sure you know who to avoid. Right. So funny. But we cut to Joaquin Phoenix in the army like recruitment office where they end up recruiting the guys that they thought were doing the crop circles, which is pretty funny. I thought this guy who was at the recruitment office, he looked more like an alien who was trying to pretend to be human to me than an actual like alien does in this movie. But just because if you watch him deliver his lines, he delivers them like he is a machine. Yeah. It's almost eerie the way he delivers his lines until they start talking about baseball. Yeah, until they start talking about baseball. And for a hot second, I was like, is he an alien? Yeah. Because I kept expecting either somebody to get body snatched or something else to happen. Yeah. And it doesn't. Um, but this is where we find out about his baseball career where he basically would just hit as hard as possible, which meant that he has all of these like batting records, but also a strikeout record. Yeah, he's Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth had like the home run record, but he also had the strikeout strikeout record at the same time right fun fact about todd babe ruth is the last time i cared about baseball <laughs> <laughs> so we cut back to the pizza restaurant they've all converged into the pizza restaurant one of the kids just says is that him and they notice m night Shyamalan out the window yeah that's the director of the movie yeah that is <laughs> yeah, the director yeah, yeah. He's, <laughs> he's, he's been here for weeks you didn't know yeah he's the guy telling you to act weird or whatever yeah that's him yeah. He then gets in his car and drives uh. away, and we don't know who he is. We don't have any information. So I thought that maybe we were missing a scene somewhere where they've established that alien specialists were coming out to investigate the crop circles. Ah, uh, okay. And that's what she was asking, like, is that him? Is that the guy that's here to look into uh. this? That was my initial first thought as I was like, oh, did we do we not have information here? Uh, because this scene's not very clear. Yeah. And it, they, they, you know, they tell you what's up later. But like this movie posits that this town is so small, everyone knows everyone. And the kids yeah. don't know the local veterinarian who killed their mom. I get that he would have kept some of that from them, but that seemed unlikely to me, too. It's clear they know who it is because she asks, is that him? They know who it was. Right. It's such a weird dynamic. And I do think that they know it was him that killed their mom. And he obviously knows too. Because when he looks up and sees them, before he drives away, he like puts his head down. He like breaks yeah. eye contact and gets in his car and just drives away. Which I have questions later of how is he not either in the midst of a bitter court battle or in prison for manslaughter? So, okay, not to get too specific or personal, but like my brother was killed right. in a car accident and we, that we were in and it was deemed an accident. You know, the guy driving, Dustin, who is a friend of mine, he wasn't charged with anything. Like it was just... Was he at fault though? Yeah, it was 100% okay. his fault. He uh, just wasn't paying attention to what he was doing and hit a phone pole. And I mean, our insurance sued their insurance, if that makes sense. And yeah. my parents got a settlement and all of that stuff, but he didn't, he didn't do jail or anything like that. Like, it wasn't and nor do I think he should have that's not what I'm saying I'm just saying yeah. that you know you can cause someone to die because of your negligence and not go to jail because of for whatever reason I, I mean and we didn't want to press charges or anything you know but he hits her walking like that's the other like it is different no you're right he runs over a pedestrian although watching this movie and especially the scene at the the scenes at the accident was really hard for me I understandable. It was yeah, hard for me yeah. and I haven't lost somebody in an accident. Yeah. So anyway, so they pull up back to the farm and Bo's baby monitor that Morgan has retrieved from the basement goes off and they're catching a signal and they can't figure out from where and they find out that it's coming from above. So they all kind of climb on top of the car. Yeah. I do love that Bo gets out of the car and she's like climbing on it and Mel yeah. Gibson's like, don't, I don't want you climbing on the car. And she's just like, whatever, dad, I'm doing whatever I want. <laughs> it's aliens. You're not my real mom. So she's just like, <laughs> Yeah, on top yeah, of the yeah, car yeah, and like yeah. grabs the walkie talkie <laughs> the metaphor is so thick right here for me because it takes all of them holding it together for them to pick up a signal i'm like i get it m night i yeah. get it yeah <laughs> 
And <laughs> once they do get that signal, they hear kind of clicking and otherworldly noises that yes. they basically interpret as two people talking. Well, two aliens talking, yeah. It's the guy on the ground signaling the ship. He's like, hey, why did you write that I have a small malark on the <laughs> <laughs> Because you told my girlfriend that her flat flaps weren't sufficient. <laughs> we're going to try to leave you behind. <laughs> like, that's the argument we're listening to on the radio. I do like that the alien's name is just Flark Cameron. I think that's great. I think we need to keep using that. Anyway, so. I think so, too. <laughs> the, the signal goes dead. So they go inside, they go to bed, and their dog is barking, and Mel Gibson takes food and water out to it, but the dog clearly senses something in the corn. But he does the dumbest thing here ever by just grabbing a flashlight and walking into the corn. Oh, right. This scene was scary. This scene scared me so bad. Yeah. So bad. It's tense and scary. I'm like, we've already been in this corn maze, so I know there's aisles, so I know at some point it's going to walk across the aisle. Oh, Paige, you're so cynical. Oh my god. That's exactly what happens. It is I was right. hundred percent. But in between that happening and where we are now in the story, we hear a bunch of clicks and pops, and it's oh, it's so scary. At this point, I literally got in the horror virgin discord and was like all caps writing, Oh my god, I'm so fucking scared right now. <laughs> <laughs> I I was listening to the clicks and pops, and I was just like, Yeah, of course there's aliens in that field. There's already crop circles out there. Like, you know they're there. It's oh your fault god. for staying this close to the field or walking into it in the middle of the night. You just to die he thinks it's a prank until the alien in the pantry that is way too long at this point when he sees the gray leg go back into the corn stuff that is when you know it's not a prank look look guys if there's anything that the last two years have taught me about humans is that we will grab on to what we hope is right and we will follow that thread up until we are arrested by the FBI for going <laughs> into the Capitol. He goes full, That's fair. full Carl Weathers in Predator here yes. where he has all the evidence in the world, and he's like, it's still the gorillas. <laughs> yeah, it's insane. But, but that's how people are. They do. If people have an idea that they don't want to accept as reality, they will do everything they can to shape their reality like it's not a part of it yeah. until that thing hits them in the face. People do it time and time again. This is exactly what our Satanic Panic series is about on Cult Podcast right now. <laughs> yeah, of just like, hey, uh, when people don't want to accept that humans have done bad things or that bad things are happening, they decide to blame the devil, apparently. <laughs> There's no way my wife would cheat on me. She's a witch. We should burn her. It was definitely the devil that made her do it. <laughs> it wasn't just that Goody Proctor goes down. It's, you know... <laughs> But that's how, I mean, that's how people are. They don't want to accept reality. Yeah. And like, they will live in denial. We all know people like this. Yeah. Mel, Mel Gibson, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so he drops the flashlight, picks it up, turns. And as he turns with the flashlight, we get a shot of one of them walking between the stalks. He runs out of the field. No, this is the most convincing. I am running away from something scary scene I think I've ever seen. That man takes the fuck off. Mikey, I almost took the fuck off. It scared me. I was like, I was so scared. Here's what I actually love. I don't love seeing the leg. Although I will say this is one of the better scares in the movie, I would say. Yeah. My favorite part of it is when he takes off. He's in a cornfield. And so there's not like a clear exit. So as he's running, it's just like. Yeah. He's running he's over the like corn. All the corn. He's just like fastest way out. Just crash through the corn. Um, and I thought that was great. Um, <laughs> and then he comes into the house where the kids are doing dishes and Joaquin Phoenix is reading a pamphlet. And he calmly sits down at the table, a broken man. And Everyone notices. I would not be <laughs> yeah. able to not yell. Everyone get the car. We got to fucking go. One, and to be honest, I don't think he still thinks it's a hoax here because the next scene they are talking about the U tangible UFOs that they can see. I think at this point it becomes a question of what he's going to do do about it i mean but when he gets to the pantry he does pretend to be a police officer yeah trying to get them but i can see that as him just lying to himself yeah i can fully understand that so that's fine because at this point he has to know it's aliens yeah well i didn't and then i mean like he has a conversation where he kind of throws his cards on the table where he like once he figures out it's actually aliens he does believe that humanity is doomed and it's the end of the world yeah so he just gets down sits at the table like oh mm -hmm. we're all gonna die so they turn on the TV because he basically sits down and he's just like shell shocked and just says, 
okay, let's turn on the TV. Yeah. And there are saucers above Mexico. They're trying to tape it and they're going to tape over her recital, but instead they tape <laughs> over Uncle Merrill's swimsuit special. <laughs> I love that. Just throw away. <laughs> Yeah, it's such a great joke, yeah. And as the night goes on, the children fall asleep with them on the couch, and they have kind of like a philosophical discussion about what they believe the outcome of these aliens will be. And these are the moments, I think, when this movie really shines. Me too. Is that it's having these in-depth conversations without losing you as the audience while making them meaningful for the characters so that we're learning more about them as people. These are the great parts of this movie. Yeah. But he basically breaks it down into group one or group two when presented with luck. So group one will see luck as a sign and everything's going to be great and someone's going to be take care of me. Group two sees it as luck and knows that they are truly alone in the world. Yeah. And what this conversation sets up is that Joaquin Phoenix is group one. Everything's going to be okay. And Mel Gibson is group two. We're all going to die eventually. Yeah. So we should probably prepare for it. I do love the story that signifies that Joaquin Phoenix's character is in the first camp. Yes. Because it's all about how he was about to kiss this lady and then something happened. Or he had to put, take his yeah, gum no. out of his mouth. And then, right. she, and then threw she threw up threw all up. over herself. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I'm pretty sure Mikey told me this exact story at the last party we hung out at together. <laughs> what? Well, he's like, I'm definitely a miracle guy. If she would have thrown up in my mouth, that would have messed with me for life. Yeah. (laughs) Those lights are a miracle is what he says after that. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But this is also where we find out the last words that Colleen said, which are see and then swing away. Although we will get the full sentence later on. Yeah. This conversation also introduces the idea that there are no such things as coincidences. Right. Which either everything's a coincidence or nothing is, which is kind of a weird binary, but it plays into this movie. Yeah. My personal life philosophy is more of a Forrest Gump model where it's like you are put into situations where you have to make a choice. It's like a mix of both. Yeah, that makes sense. Then we get a flashback where he approaches the roadblock where his wife has been killed and he's still dressed as a reverend at the time. He thinks it's a drunk driving accident. But we find out that somebody fell asleep at the wheel and that she's still talking, but she's not in an ambulance, which means she's not going to make it. Yeah. Well, and that hurt that she is pinned in such a way that she is alive, but she will die soon. Yeah. So he wakes up on the couch. He gets up and follows an extension cord into the closet where Joaquin Phoenix is watching TV because he's basically like, hey, schools are closed and the kids were hogging the TV. And well, and they shouldn't be watching it because it's scary as shit. Yeah, because there are full-blown UFOs who look like they're gone, but then they have a video of a dead bird flying into a wall. Which, to be honest, I would have rather we saw the dead bird video than the birthday party video. I at least wanted both. Yeah. Dude, the dead bird thing would have been very scary as well. Yeah, well, not only would it have been scary, I think they could have done it better CGI-wise. Probably. So it wouldn't have been as distracting. And then I would have liked Joaquin (laughs) Phoenix hitting baseballs out into the field and one hit a thing. I thought that was going to happen. They set up the whole baseball thing that he's grabbing his stuff. He throws that rock out into the field. And I and this is much later. We haven't gotten there yet. But I thought for sure that the rock he threw in the field was going to hit like a clear wall. That would have been so cool. Or like or like they're tossing the ball and he hits like a home run. It goes pretty high up and then, then hits something and falls. I yes. would have been down with it. Either one. And both of those would have been easier to do than the CG creatures. And both would have been fucking scary. Daytime horror too. So it's stuff like that that I'm like, how did we miss this? Like, how yeah. is this not here? Both of those would have been amazing scares. Or yeah. if you only hear about the bird and then the baseball thing happens. Exactly. Yeah. Oh. So at this point, more saucers have appeared all over the place using the crop circles as a sort of mapping system. We cut to Mel Gibson takes a shower. Outside, the swings are moving and he kind of hears the kids whispering in their bedroom. He comes in and they're both wearing tin foil hats. Yeah, I thought this was super cute, man. Is very cute. They're reading the book on aliens, talking about how they're probably vegetarians. And he's like, who wrote this? And I love that the kid's line is, scientists who have been persecuted for their beliefs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Uh, and we, re- we find out that it's Dr. Bimboo. Now, for a hot second, I thought that maybe M. Night Shyamalan, because we still don't know who he is, 
was Dr. Bimboo. And what? that's oh. and that's why he's there to investigate the aliens. He's like a member of MUFON. And yeah. like that's what's happening. Uh and but then it, it's never followed up on, so it's clearly not him. But when the fact that they mentioned this doctor by name, I was like, well, maybe that's who he is. Did you hear that a part of the COVID relief thing that they snuck in was that every government uh agency has to disclose what they know about UFOs in 180 days? Yeah. I'm so excited for that. Me too. Except not. I'm going to have a lot of anxiety around that. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Real life aliens terrifying. This movie is a one for me. Real life aliens, 12. (laughs) Anyway, within the alien book, there is a picture of a saucer blasting a house that looks like their house with dead bodies on the ground that look like them. And the phone rings and I am assuming Todd shit his pants. (laughs) It scared me. Yeah, (laughs) it was very scary. Also, right around this time, it was right before the phone rang. But one of my cats, Stormageddon, jumped up on the bed and that also scared the shit out of me. I like what Mel Gibson says after this, which is everyone needs to calm down and eat some fruit or something. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I did too. That's what my mom does. My mom last night was like. He never ate fruit. I was like, what? Why are you bringing that up? <laughs> Pineapple could have solved this, just like it'll solve John Bonet's murder. <laughs> oh, God. You're welcome. Nailed it. Yeah. Alien species are probably like, they watch long videos of other people of their species getting brutally murdered, and they like it. They're terrible. <laughs> 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 One of their favorite podcasts is just two women talking about them killing each other. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone on the planet has their favorite murder. Yep. Which is, a murder is when you <laughs> maliciously kill another being of the species. Oh, you mean like what we're going to totally do to Flark Cameron later? <laughs> Flark Cameron. <laughs> Flark Cameron murdered by a baseball bat. So he answers the phone and there's just a voice that says father. And then the line goes dead. Yeah. And he kind of looks into his wife's, I guess craft room is kind of what it looks like. Cause there's a dress form with a, a partially made dress on it. He goes downstairs, grabs a coat and basically says, I'm going out for a few minutes. I'm going to Ray Reddy's house. Cause I think he just called here, which I do want to take a second. Cause the movie doesn't prepare us for this. Six months after your wife was killed by a a careless driver yeah would you be willing to just go over to that person's house and mel gibson was a priest i mean granted he lost his faith but he does not seem to have malicious intent towards ready right and he probably pushed the police and the da not to press charges because it was an accident and he will beat himself up and that's punishment enough and it's a small town so they probably really listened to what he wanted to do and to be honest i think that's the only way ready's not in prison when it happened to me uh and Mm -hmm. You know, Dustin was driving, he was careless, and we hit a phone pole and my brother died. It was important to me that everyone at school, when we went back to school, knew that it wasn't his fault. Like, I knew that I would get sympathy because it was my brother. I I, I was worried that people would hate him because he quote-unquote killed my brother. But to be clear, that's not the way it is. So it... I don't know. It's uh, it's ugh. it's tough. I would it like to think that I would be able to talk to somebody six months after. I I, I don't know if I could because I'm a very emotional guy. But I hung out with Dustin all through high school. We would have stayed friends through college too. When he went to a different school. Like it was important to me that we stay friends. Mm. We were friends okay. before he made a mistake that should not dictate his entire life. And we were friends after. Like, if he called me right now and was like, hey, do you want to grab a beer? I'd be like, cool, I'll get a Diet Coke while we drink and reminisce, you know? Yeah. So it's it's possible, but... Okay. As he leaves, Morgan and Bo are talking upstairs while they're looking at the alien book and everything. And Morgan asks her, do you have one of your feelings again? And she says, yeah. And he says, is it bad? And she says, I don't want you to die. And he's like, what do you mean you don't want me to die? And she just says, I don't want you to die. And then they leave it at that. We don't get any more well, info. Yeah. Kids say creepy shit all the time. They really do. I once heard a story about a friend of mine who was hanging out with one of his friend's daughters. And she looked at him and just said, you're all alone in the world. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we cut to the farm where Mel Gibson shows up. No one seems to be home. He goes around the back of the house, looks in the windows. He sees that the house has been disturbed inside, but their car is still there and there's someone sitting in it. So he goes up to the window. The whole car is full of boxes. There's blood on him in the car. And it is M. Night Shyamalan. So now we we kind of are connecting some dots. The car being packed 
makes me furious. If you were attacked by an alien, <laughs> got away, trapped it in your pantry, I am not taking an hour and a half to pack my car. I am just leaving. <laughs> I'll come back for my shit. Yeah. Like, I don't need it right now. Well, I mean... Maybe. No, what? I'm with Todd on this one. I'm <laughs> insane. I, I am leaving with the clothes on my back. And if we defeat the aliens, maybe my stuff will still be here. <laughs> I can't guarantee my house would not be on fire when I left it. Yeah. I'd burn that shit down. Yeah. My thing is that, like, they just leave this. Th they just leave Clark Cameron in the pantry. Clark Cameron, Mikey. Like, Mel Gibson just cuts his fingers off and doesn't even tell anybody about it. <laughs> That's true, actually. <laughs> yeah. So he asks him what happened, and he basically is like, hey, I've been meaning to call you for the last six months, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. But when I knew it was inside the house, I couldn't think of a number, another number to call, so I panicked. And he says, I've never fallen asleep driving before or since, so it had to be at that right moment. Basically, it was a coincidence. Yeah. As I was passing her for those 10 to 15 seconds, I fell asleep. And that I'm sorry, basically. Yeah. But I mean, that's true. Yeah. And he does apologize to him where he's like, I know what I've done to you. I'm deeply sorry. I made you question your faith. It, I had no intent to do this to you. And I'm sorry that I did. And then he just kind of goes to leave and is like, oh, by the way, don't open my pantry. I found one of them and locked it in. Bye. Also, I'm going to the lake because I don't think they like water. Bye. Bye. But he like straight up peels out of there. Yeah. Well, that part makes sense. Yeah. Would you have gone in the house after that guy drove away? Absolutely no. not. Are you insane? I'd be calling that police officer and being like, hey, we got the, one. The scene should be Mel Gibson and the sheriff in this house, like having scares with this alien. Yes. The only way I would go back into this house is if I had the sheriff with me and she walked up to the pantry and pulled an Oscar Pistorius through the door until that <laughs> alien's body hit the ground. That is a very true crime joke. That is, but it's absolutely what I would do. And I, yeah. it's, a, it's a bad example because he's a murderer. But at the same time, you know what? What we need in this movie is an alien murderer and fits the bill. Yeah. <laughs> what happened in this fight to make him think that they don't like water? And he says it's because none of the mapped locations are near laked, lakes. But that's fucking bullshit. Maybe they can't land on water. But what would have been definitive evidence is if while fighting him in his kitchen which is where he fought this thing yeah that they encounter water in a place where water is likely to occur it's a kitchen yeah he could just been like after i killed it i peed on it and it melted <laughs> <laughs> they really hate golden showers mikey or i tried to like we, we knocked into the faucet and the spray hurt him like in in the struggle like, there's so many natural ways that can happen that we could have seen and learned, and instead we get it in exposition. Right. Anyway, we cut back to Joaquin Phoenix watching the news, and this is the footage of that seventh birthday in Brazil. Oh. Uh, and they're like, what you are about to see might disturb you. And he's doing the whole, like, move, children. Vamanos. It was so funny. <laughs> My thoughts on this are, I think you see too much of the alien here. Oh, yeah? I, f I f yeah, absolutely, because it doesn't look good. And I know that's 2020 me with 2020 CG eyes looking at this. Yes. Yeah, well, you always look back to movies with 2020 vision. You do. <laughs> but I feel like the leg in the cornfield works a lot better because it's in darkness. We don't fully see it. We just know it's there, and that's what makes it scarier. In theaters in 2002, it's on screen for like a second. It scared the shit out of me. Mikey, late last night, it scared the shit out of me. I, I'm here to tell you on a first viewing, when you're hearing them say, it's behind it, it's behind it, I know to now look at the hedge, and I'm like, oh, it's going to be an alien. And it walks across, and I'm like, that was the alien. And now I have no more mysteries for this movie. Oh, my God. It scared the shit out of me. It was so yeah. scary. <laughs> this scene was not scary anymore. The other scenes were the other jump scares were scarier. Like the, the claw mm -hmm. was what got me the most. Oh, yeah. The, the uh, claw is also extremely scary, which we're about to but, see. But right. I just remember this, this scene being iconic because it just yes. was terrifying. The best part about this scene, I think, is Joaquin Phoenix's reaction. Yes. That's yes. The most effective part of this. I do think it's a little crazy that no. No one at this seven-year-old birthday party had a super soaker. Like, there's no <laughs> way.
way that that alien would not have been the first one that died. Oh, you mean in a coastal city like Rio de Janeiro? <laughs> I do mean like that. The whole thing about that, oh, they're nowhere near water. Oh, the ocean. The ocean is right there. Plot holes. Anyway, we cut to Mel Gibson in the house. The pantry's barricaded. We see a shadow moving under the doorway, which I think is very effective. Yes. Very scary. It is. Um, he claims to be a police officer. He's trying to like talk to it. He looks under the door, but he can't see. He grabs a knife from the counter. It's a Wusthof eight inch chef's knife classic. Thank you. Oh my God. And <laughs> so he grabs it and angles it under the door to look into the pantry and he doesn't really see anything. So he kind of walks away. Right. He walks back and tries again and a hand reaches out and he cuts oh. the fingers off. Now, Oh I think God. this is one of their better scares. Yeah. This was scary. The knife is very tense. That's great. And the hand is a practical effect. Yeah. See, again, this was early 2000s where they're like, this is the future. As a people, we should have realized that they, CGI enhances, but it's, it, practical effects are the way things need to be. I mean, practical effects are still the better option. I, yeah. I, I think a good combination of both is your best option. Yes. So Mel Gibson comes home and they're all sitting in tinfoil hats. God, I love this shot. This reveal of both the two kids and uh, Joaquin, Joaquin Phoenix. Phoenix. Holy shit, it's so funny. It is so well done. Yep. Mel Gibson sits on the stairs and Joaquin Phoenix is basically like, their skin changes colors. That's why we couldn't see them at night. And he asks about the book basically what would happen if aliens were hostile and it's basically one of two things either they're defeated and they come back hundreds of thousands of years from now if at all or they yeah. win and we die and it's happening they have to accept that these are hostile and now they're in danger yeah and he says i heard a theory that they don't like places near water we should go to the lake i love immediately that morgan the son goes that sounds made up dad yeah. Idiot. <laughs> he does say at this point that he found one in that pantry. Yes. He basically is like, who wants to go to the lake? And they're split 50 50. Uh, but eventually the tide turns and they vote to stay. Well, that's because uh, Mel Gibson decides to change the rules. And he's like, well, then if it's a tie, I get two votes because I count for both myself and uh -huh. mom. All right. And well, then the son was like, I demand a recount. Yeah. yeah. Here's the thing, though. The sign for all the people should have just been like, go to the lake house. Yeah. Because if Mel Gibson won, I don't think we'd be in as much trouble as we got into. No, I think they would have been fine. I mean, ultimately, they are fine. Right. No one dies yeah. in this movie. I guess. But like they got real close you know and so i, I would have been in the basement being like you guys uh really think we should have maybe gone to the lake house yeah <laughs> oh yeah there's no way three days later mel gibson is not only talking about how they should have gone to the lake house <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he tells them he wants to board up all the windows, and they're like, what makes you think that's going to stop them? And he's like, well, they seem to have trouble with pantry door. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was very funny. Joaquin Phoenix walks from the garage where he lives into the house, and he's got uh, supplies with him, basically. And he sees rustling in the corn. Could be the wind, could be something more. But he backs up, picks up a rock, throws it into the field, yep, and then backs up and slowly walks towards the house. And the fact that they don't have that rock hit something flat and fall, missed opportunity. It would have been so good. Yeah. It would have been very, very cool. Yeah. We get back inside. The saucers are back and they're reporting that there's more. There's uh, saucers are in 274 cities, likely 400 cities within the hour. Yeah. And they tend to be appearing within one mile of the crop circles, which means that they're going to be like on their farm. Yeah. And they basically think that they're staging an attack. They're hostile. Most people have flocked to temples and synagogues and churches. And the newscaster basically says, God be with us all. Mel Gibson watches it and just says, I'm going to get back to the windows. Yeah. Morgan turns to Joaquin Phoenix and just says, like, you won't let anything happen to us, right? I wish you were my dad. And he basically says, don't say anything like that ever again. But that kind of comes out of nowhere. Because, like, Mel Gibson hasn't really been mean to Morgan. At this point, he's believing in everything Morgan has said. Yeah. They're listening to the book. 
I don't really understand where it's coming from. Okay, so in that moment, I didn't understand why he said that. But in the dinner scene, I feel like I sort of understand it because yeah. Morgan incorrectly blames his dad for his mother dying. He like says, you let her die, which is ultimately just the most insane thing to say. Yeah. Because, I mean, no, no, I didn't. She was dying. Like, what, what do you want me to do? Mel Gibson looks out the window as he's boarding it up and the wind chimes are going nuts. Yeah. And they realize that they have too many windows, not enough wood. So they start boarding up bedrooms and they're all going to sleep in the family room and he says they'll tie the dog up in the garage but they never get a chance to do that so they do kill that second dog well they don't but the aliens surely do yeah surely do they decide that everyone's basically going to have whatever they want for dinner which for me begged to question how soon was their last grocery run and how big is their fridge for I know. everything that they propose making <laughs> <laughs> French toast with mashed potatoes. Okay, French toast is easy to do, and so is mashed potatoes. Same. French Chicken well, teriyaki. Is not easy to do. All right, what's your alien invasion meal? What's your last meal before you die? Okay, if I could have anything. Uh -huh. There was a restaurant back home that is no longer in existence, but they used to have like a gorgonzola cream sauce penne that they would Ooh. serve with this thing called scusi, which is essentially like pizza dough flattened out and somehow stuffed with gorgonzola, garlic and butter. And then they like sandwich it between another pizza dough deep fry it and then slice it and then you put bruschetta inside it i would eat it till i died i love it so Ooh, much that sounds good i've never had that i'm a simple man you know i would like a tomahawk steak <laughs> medium rare uh scallop potatoes uh-huh maybe a green beanish uh like our brussels sprout like a well-done green beans or brussels sprouts uh, I think I think that'd be pretty good. There was a place called The Lot in San Diego that had a smoked Gouda mac and cheese that was Ooh. so good, and you could add chicken to it. Oh, so good. So probably that. Gouda is involved in two of the three of these choices, and I want to know <laughs> that Gouda is one of my favorite cheeses as well. I will say this, though. I am a little afraid that Mikey would, under some pretense, start yelling at us at our final meal dinner just so he could have bites of all of our food. <laughs> And that is that is basically what Mel Gibson does. It's just like, well, fuck it. I'm I'm having some of everything. And they get into this kind of manufactured fight about him letting mom die that I think is yeah. honestly just them like emotions are at a high. I think Everyone's so, yeah. anxious and worried. Well, because Morgan walks over there after saying he hates you and that you you let mom die. And they just like hug. They just like embrace, yeah. which is so, so sad. Because they're going through a lot anyway. Like, I remember after Logan died, like, we would have moments like that at our house where we would just all be crying for no reason. I mean, there, yeah. I mean, obviously there's a reason, but, like, mm -hmm. it wasn't something that set it off. We weren't fighting. It would just be insane and intense. Yeah. On a lighter note, that was me during the final season of Game of Thrones. Jeez. <laughs> Those two things are very similar, Mikey. You're right. <laughs> I mean, the disappointment, <laughs> like right there. Yeah. My favorite went is when movie Mel Gibson turns into real Mel Gibson for just a second, and he's like, "Stop crying!" And I'm like, "There it is." <laughs> but then they they angle on baby Abigail Breslin. And her sad face wrecks me. And that's yeah. when yeah. I started crying. I was just like, oh, poor baby angel. I don't know. I was just like, oh, uh, Then they have a group hug. But then the baby monitor goes off. Oh, no. Oh, no. So they go to board up the rest of the doors. They search through the house. Um, even the bugs outside get quiet, which is something that you only notice if you're like looking for stuff like that, but it's something uh -huh. they could have been doing the whole time. <laughs> oh, they were fighting. I would have taken the French toes in the basement for show. Oh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so they board up the last door. Yeah. And after they do, this is the part of the movie where I started sobbing and I was crying so hard I couldn't be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Your husband is the one who was afraid. He's like, is it our anniversary? No, thankfully he was at work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh. peek behind the curtain. I got very, very upset during Avengers Endgame and cried a lot. And then like two days later, Jake came home and I was crying and he was like, are you okay? And I was just like, yeah. And he was like, is it about Captain America again? And I was like, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. So he gives 
Abigail Breslin, this pep talk of like, you were a baby and you smiled and babies that young can't smile. It's this like beautiful, sad story. The whole birth stories that he does for both of his kids are is oh, super yeah. sad. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because this is him telling a story to his daughter while aliens are beating on the doors, breaking yeah. windows. I mean, Joaquin Phoenix breaks into the story every now and then and says they're on the roof. Yeah. They just broke into one of the bedrooms. They're inside, yeah. So and scary. you know he's doing it because he's like, we're gonna die. Yes. So I need to tell you these things before we die. Well, yeah, I think he's just trying to keep them calm because they are going to die. Why g die freaking out when you can die thinking about a happy time in your life and that your parents love you and all that stuff? Yeah. Right. It's a very kind thing he's doing, but it only makes it much more scary for me. So as they're kind of, you know, the aliens are at the back door, they're at the front door, we literally blow past a great scare where they are kind of running down towards the basement and he turns to look at the front door and there's just a claw underneath oh, yeah. the yeah. front scary. door. And I was just like, that's great. And it's also a practical effect and it's eerie and creepy yeah. and we're blowing past it. Blink yep. and you miss it. They go downstairs where they reveal that they forgot the dog, so. Well, you also hear the dog get murdered right around this time, yeah. Yeah, they're listening to them outside and this is when he starts giving Morgan his birth story. Yes. Which is just soul crushing. <laughs> they're sad that they forgot their foil helmets and <laughs> yeah Morgan does mention that but his dad's like what no no one needs that shut up <laughs> well he's also you're scaring your sister and she just says I'm already scared <laughs> yeah that, that was great yeah <laughs> and he basically says is there anything to wedge against the door and the knob is turning and they're scrambling through the basement to find something and he just says I'm not ready yeah. Which, again, is the emotional center of this movie being fantastic because this is him reconciling his cynicism in the face of actual fear. Yeah. Which is like, I'm not ready to die. Clearly, I have to fight. I have to hope that there is something to do, which means I have to be person number one. It's all in that one phrase. Yeah, it's great. They find a pickaxe, but as he grabs it, he accidentally knocks the light bulb out. Stupid idiot. Joaquin Phoenix, you fucking moron. Stupid God. fucking idiot. Uh, so he <laughs> hands him the pickaxe. They do manage to brace the door. Yeah. Morgan finds flashlights. Uh, they find Bo. She's hiding, but she's okay. And they can hear the aliens moving outside. At this point they realize that they're not actually banging on the door. They're just making noises. Yeah, they're not trying to break it down. They're just like making noises. So they're like using it as a distraction. And Morgan's like, yeah, they're excellent problem solvers. So they're probably trying to find a way in here that's not through that door that's barricaded. And then Mel Gibson's like, Wait, they used to put coal down here through a coal shaft, which, what? Is that a thing? In houses, I guess? It's a Victorian house, which would have had, like, wood fireplaces or, like, a coal stove. Okay, so it makes sense, I guess. Yeah. But then they start, like, shining the flashlights around to the, quote-unquote, hole or the, the, you know, the shaft that would be there. And then the lights converge on Morgan, and he's standing right in front of it, and he's like, what? And then that hand grabs him. Oh, yeah. I, that scared me so much, man. I, I lost my shit in that moment. As their flashlights are moving and they show on Morgan, I was like, oh, there's an alien right behind him somehow. And oh. then the claw came out and I yeah. was like, did I write this? I mean, I knew something like that was going to happen because you can feel it. Like the music builds to it. And this movie does a good job of building tension. Mm -hmm. So you feel it about to happen, but it's still like I still like jerked back and like it, it scared me a whole lot. A whole lot. Now, like right after it is one of my favorite scares of the movie, but... They do the natural human thing of dropping the flashlight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so what we see is the flashlight rolling. We're catching beams of action, but not actual stuff. We're basically seeing chaos through the lens of a flashlight and sound. So we don't fully know what's going on. And I actually loved it. 
Yeah, because it's super scary. I mean, even when they drop the flashlights and you see Bo in the corner, yes. it was very reminiscent of Blair Witch Project, which yep. we have not done for this. Right. But scared me so bad I ruined a first date and never saw that girl again. Or we didn't date again, at least. <laughs> um, and Welcome to every first date I go on. <laughs> but that's by your choice, Mikey. This was not. <laughs> um, but anyways, I was very scared by that imagery. Yeah. Uh, then... When we finally kind of regain control of the scene, they grab the flashlights. We see Joaquin Phoenix is kind of stacking what looks like cement or fertilizer in front of that coal chute. But what we discover now that the lights are kind of back on is that Morgan is having a violent asthma attack and they don't have his meds. Yeah, that coal dust. I think it's more that he almost was murdered by an alien from a different world. But yeah, I mean, coal dust too, Mikey. And <laughs> this is where the bow, the little girl says, I dreamed this. Yeah. And then they basically have to try and calm his asthma attack down naturally i thought this was insane i don't even i didn't even know you could do this really like so as someone with severe asthma yeah i was gonna ask because you've like have been to the hospital for asthma stuff right so yeah I actually yeah something that happens later is part of why i ended up in the hospital one time okay so can you calm an asthma attack down naturally sometimes but it's not a guarantee it's not very safe and you are left prone in a state to have another attack again. And you can't do it with really serious asthma attacks. Like there's a point of no return. Yeah, there's a Rubicon, right? Like so you could go past it and you're fucked without medicine. Exactly. And this movie posits that he basically gets there. Yeah. The thing that I think is nuts is his dad's talking very calmly. He's got his hand on his chest and is like breathing with him. And yeah. then I don't know if it starts working or not, but Mel Gibson starts yelling about how you're not going to take it from me and all of that shit. Yeah. And I'm like, that's probably not helping the situation at all. No. And, and the attack seems to calm down, but not completely, which is the one thing yeah. that I actually kind of was glad that they included that they don't cure it. He's still not doing great. Right. Because any asthma attack you have leaves you very weak and it's a whole body exhaustion because your whole body hasn't had oxygen like it would yeah. make my arms and legs hurt and cramp up because they didn't have enough oxygen so the kid is even though he survives this peak he is not out of the woods yet but they turn off the flashlights we get a flashback and this is where he ends up reliving the conversation of realizing that this would be the last time he would talk with his wife because she's pinned between the truck and the tree and that's the only thing keeping her alive basically this conversation so oh, it broke me in a yeah. very very yeah. like reminiscent way i was yeah. very sad watching this scene uh, so he wakes up because he doesn't have the conversation yet. He it, This is just him preparing yeah. to have it in the flashback. It cuts before it happens. He wakes up and Joaquin Phoenix basically is like, hey, I found a pack of light bulbs. Also, by the way, we beat the aliens while you were asleep. I hate this. <laughs> 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 also the u.s army found super soakers and have destroyed the aliens so we're good yeah people found a way to beat them and then when they listen to the tv later it's like some primitive method we don't know what it is yet and you're just like God, I can't. yeah they don't they don't say what it is and they also say well i guess it's just the guy on the radio but i feel like this is important he says no one believes me but i think they're they were just stealing us they don't want our resources they wanted us yeah here's my theory on my rewatch. And I, right. I don't think the aliens were there to conquer. I think it was like a raid for like resources. The only way any of these actions make sense is if they're really desperate aliens and like starving or running out of food or running out of like materials. And so they're like, let's just go to this shithole planet. It's on the way. Raid it. Get the fuck out of there. We get our, our foot soldiers. There's plenty of them. We just need resources. Get as many resources as we can in like a day and get out. I would argue it doesn't matter. We're getting information that doesn't have a ton of bearing. What I want to know is how they got rid of them. 
And we never actually find that out. I think we find out that they're scared of water. I postulate that we didn't get rid of them at all. They got what they wanted and they left. Like they just had a time frame. It was like raid the sh raid the planet as much as you can in 24 hours. And then we leave. I mean, that could be. And it's the only way that it explains that they would do this to a planet of 70% water. They wouldn't want to live here because you could be killed at any time by them throwing liquid on you. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't think their plan was ever to live here. I think they were here to collect resources. I don't think that they got what they needed and left. I think they got interrupted by realizing that there was 70% of the planet that was toxic to them. And I don't think they knew that going in. Either way... It doesn't matter because the humans on Earth would never know. Right. So essentially, uh, he gets a pep talk from Joaquin Phoenix, who's just like, hey, uh, you're giving up on us and that is not OK. Yeah. I don't want to ever see your eyes like I saw your eyes last night. Do you understand me? Like he gives him a yeah. like, don't ever fucking do that again. Sort of a talk. Uh, and now they're like, well, Morgan's been sleeping, but he's breathing heavy. He needs his medicine. And they think yeah. the coast is clear. So they go upstairs and he says at this point, if he has another attack, it'll kill him. And he's actually very correct. The one time I came closest to dying was because I had an attack. I'd been treated for the attack and thought I was feeling better, but I wasn't. I needed more treatment and I thought I was feeling fine and left and had another attack while driving and drove myself to the ER Ugh. where I then collapsed on the floor of the ER at 70% lung function and then had to spend five days in the hospital. Oh mm. man. So the, the time right after an asthma attack is your most vulnerable. But he takes the baby monitor out of his pocket. There's no signals. So they go upstairs, they carry Morgan with them. He tells them to get the syringes well because they may need to give him a shot. That's actually also, they should give him a shot, probably. Yeah. He lays him down on the couch, and they reveal that they're dancing on TV. It's so cute how she reveals that they're dancing on TV, because yeah. she's like, they're doing this, and she's dancing like a toddler would dance. You know, she's older <laughs> than a toddler, but yeah. she's dancing like that. And then he's like, oh, cool, I'll just wheel the TV in. And then, yeah. dude, that reveal of the monster or the alien in the TV reflection. Oh, so Good scary. Good shot, yeah. It is. And honestly, they should have left it. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> because, because. I think so too. The reflection yeah. works because it's obscured. You don't fully see yeah. it. And it is fucking terrifying. And that is yeah. a great scare. And then they turn and you're just like, oh, is the green man here from Always Sunny? What's going on? Like, <laughs> but essentially the, the alien is holding Morgan. Yeah. And it's the one we see from the, the hand that's the one that he wounded yesterday. Yeah, it's Flark Cameron. Flark Cameron, yeah. And he's got his like talons poised over Morgan's face. We get an inner cut of the flashback of his last conversation with Colleen, where she gives him directions of like, tell Morgan to play games. It's okay to be silly. Tell Bo to listen to her brother, tell Graham and he's Graham yeah. to see and Meryl to swing away. And finally he sees, he sees the bat on the wall. He sees Meryl standing next to it. We see the plaque that says 507 feet and he just says, swing away, Meryl. And Meryl grabs the bat and hits the alien, but not in time because the alien does get a chance to spray Morgan with poison gas. Yeah, whatever the gas is that comes out of his arm. What, what drove me crazy is if, okay, say that's Mikey and me in that situation and Mikey just says, Todd, swing away. I'd be like, what? Yeah. Swing what away? What are we talking about? That's because you don't believe in the signs. I don't. I mean, no, that would be ridiculous for me to automatically understand. That would make you what I like to call conversationally inconsiderate because I am not in your head and I don't know what you're saying to yourself that would let me know what's going on. They just had a conversation about her last words being swing away. But what are the odds he'd remember that? Yeah, come on. They just had that conversation. A lot has happened since then, Mikey. First of all, that conversation was two days ago in the world of the movie. Yeah. Secondly, aliens don't speak fucking English. Say whatever the fuck you want. Hey, grab the bat and beat the shit out of that yes. alien, Mikey. He should have whispered swing away to himself and then been like, oh, grab the bat and hit him. Yeah. Yeah. So he grabs Morgan as the alien drops him because he gets hit with the bat and rushes him outside. Joaquin goes to town on this alien with the bat yeah. until he accidentally knocks him into a couple of the glasses of water that Bo has left behind and it burns his skin. 
So Joaquin starts going to town on the water and he's like hitting glasses at him, knocking him into stuff that's going to drip on him. It's a whole thing. He's getting peppered by both shards of glass and what is to the alien more or less acid. It's like the worst day ever. And he's like, you guys drink this shit? What is going on? (laughs) Like that alien is so confused. Mel Gibson, meanwhile, takes his asthmatic child into the grass for an EpiPen shot. Which, yeah. as as someone with severe asthma, mine is triggered by allergies a lot of the time. Yeah. If if you dragged me while I was having an asthma attack into grass, you are killing me. I'm gonna die. <laughs> like that is it. Checked out. That's all it would take. I mean, there is danger in the house. Like I understand why you'd want to take him out of the house, but like they have a big porch. They can just bring him onto the porch, right? Yeah. Or there's a table out there. Put him on the table. Just anything to not be laying in the grass. Yeah. <laughs> but he ends up giving him an EpiPen shot, and inside, Walking Phoenix kills the alien. He breaks the bat over him. Well, and he knocks him down, and then the, a glass of water pours right on his face. Yeah. It's amazing. So he comes outside. They're all on the grass together, and basically, Mel Gibson is saying his lungs were closed so no poison could get in. It's not luck that he has asthma. He survives, essentially. Like, it's him being group number one yes. of like, I have to believe that something is going to help. That is the way asthma works is that your bronchodilators are closed, but no, po- I guess not enough poison got in. Well, I mean, what he explains is how the son is actually still alive. Yeah. And it turns out that that's what happens. And that's what happens. And the son does survive. So we pan inside the house We pan across the bedroom. Now it's snowing. We close on the bathroom door where we see Mel Gibson getting ready for a church service again in his father garb. Frock or whatever you call it. Frock, vestments, collar. And And that's that's the movie. movie. So having seen it, having talked about it, what do you guys think? Let's get some final thoughts going. I mean, I think I said a lot of thoughts in this episode, but I'm I'm just going <laughs> to distill it into this is a movie with a great emotional center, great character development, fantastic cinematography, and just bad horror pieces. Okay, I did not like this movie. Full on hated it because it's so scary. Like there are so many scary elements. And I know, Paige, you're like laughing at me in your head because you're like, it's not scary at all. But this really, really got me. And I do think at the the heart of this movie, the emotional core of it, as you were calling it, is very, very effective. And I think the jump scares are super effective for me. And it's just super scary. And honestly, maybe it's just because of some stuff that happened to me when I was a kid with my brother dying and the way he died. And and it was very similar to what happens in this movie with their mom. The whole like when he's having the last conversation with his wife, I was in bed weeping with my girlfriend asleep next to me. Like it was just so sad for me. I sobbed through the last 20 minutes of this movie. Absolutely. Yeah, it's <laughs> so sad. Because I remember having that like conversation with my brother. It wasn't really a conversation because he was fully gone. But I pulled him from the truck, laid him on the ground and like was like, oh, no, please don't. Let's not. No. Like, and then yeah. it just, it, it, ugh, it's just, fuck, it was rough. Um, yeah. So it yeah. was just reminding me of all of that, you know. But yeah. that is like trauma specifically for yeah, me. Yeah, no, no, no. You know? Thank you for sharing that. That's very Ugh. similar to what happened. Just like the final season of Game of Thrones. Good uh, Lord. <laughs> and listen, Mikey, that trauma did happen to both of us. So like as a shared trauma between you and me, yeah, I can yeah, I yeah. can go ahead and let you know. Very similar. It felt very similar. It's the same. It's the same. Basically the same thing. I mean, I think we, I think we all know. <laughs> No, thank you for sharing. No, I mean, I'm with Todd. I think, I think, I think it is scary. One, I don't like alien things. They scare me. Alien abduction <laughs> things, I guess. I don't know. Aliens on Earth. Science fiction stuff outside of Earth doesn't really scare me because I've never been there. Oh, my God. <laughs> I couldn't really empathize with the aliens because I've never gone to an, an, another world and, like, tried to abduct people. But, uh, I mean, I think the core of it is you care about these characters so much that you are scared that something bad is going to happen to them. Because I, yeah. I, I think it's one of those times where you actually care about the people in the movie. So any death would have been very, very rough. And, Mikey, something horrible has already happened to them. Yes. Six months ago, they lost a core member of their family. If they would have killed off one of these characters, I would have been devastated. Oh, yeah. If if Morgan had died from his asthma attack, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I would have been gutted. 
I fully thought he was going to, but then I was like, how are they going to bring Mel Gibson back around if that happens? And I, I knew right. they wouldn't be able to. Yeah. And so th then at that point, I was like, well, he's probably going to live. I would argue this movie is better if it does not end with him going back to church. I thought that was a strange character arc as well. Did not like it, but that's fine. I mean, I realize that people do turn to religion in times of great stress or great trauma, especially if it goes their way. People sometimes have trouble feeling like, oh, I did this. I'm the one that did this because I actually took all the steps needed to make it through whatever. And they, because they don't feel like they are the ones that could have done whatever they did, they have to say, well, God did it for me. Or God gave me the strength to. And, and so I do sort of understand why that would happen. I just did not like it. I do think he turns back to the cloth because all of these coincidences led to his family surviving. And, he, you know, and he, he believes in fate again, I guess. I, I feel like that's actually my problem with it. Because I yeah. feel like this movie equates his religious association with his lack of cynicism where the movie is positing that his happiest most hopeful form is tied to that religion as opposed to just him being happy and hopeful and yeah, i feel yeah. like the movie does a ton of work to i th i think if they would have taken fate as the element out and more of like cynicism versus optim like hope i think that would go push him back there because like him like holding the door and being like i want to live and stuff like that that gets him closer to that. I'm going to go one step further and say he doesn't need to be religious at all in this movie and it would actually work better. Yeah, the religion part doesn't bother me until he goes back to it at the end. Here's the thing, it's it's my least it's my least worrisome part of a movie that I have many notes about. The thing that bugs me the most about this movie is if you had a cross indention on your dirty wall, you wouldn't like get some soft scrub or like <laughs> whatever like a magic eraser and or get that off the wall. Actually, when the cross is back up on the wall at the very end, it is a cleaned wall yeah right. which i think it's great i mean he is clearly depressed at the beginning of this movie and not cleaning his house i get that like i'm not mad at that at all so Paige, do you have some fun facts for us so fun facts first they based a lot of this movie on the birds invasion of the body snatchers and night of the living dead which is where we get like them hiding out in the house yeah uh, invasion of the body snatchers has a lot of like croppy stuff um, but it's essentially the vision of an apocalyptic event through a small group of people. Um, he actually approached Clint Eastwood and Paul Newman for Mel Gibson's role first because he pictured him as much older. And both of those men turned the role down. Uh, but Mel Gibson really liked the script and accepted the role. And I do think he does a great job at it. Like I said, I don't think any of the acting in this is bad. No, I think it's all great. You know, um, originally Mark Ruffalo was cast in Joaquin Phoenix's role and he actually really? started pre-production. Wow, what? really? But then dreamed that he contracted a brain tumor during the shoot. So the next day he went to the doctor and found out that he really did have a brain tumor. What? Yep, forcing him to drop out of the film and be replaced by Joaquin Phoenix. And the tumor proved to be benign but it cost him his hearing in his left ear and it partially paralyzed his face for a temporary amount of time. And it took over a year before he was well enough to act in movies again. That what? is crazy. I did not even know this. Yeah. That's because this is 2002 back when he had done like 13 going on 30 and like maybe one other thing. If that, yeah. I think 13 going on 30 is after he recovers now in real life as i mentioned crop circles are wheat fields and m night Shyamalan thought corn would be scarier because it's taller and harder to flatten uh he likes to set all of his movies in and around philadelphia it's his hometown mm -hmm. but in order to find a location where he could plant 40 acres of corn and have it grow tall enough in time for the shoot so that they could do the crop circles he had to shoot this movie on the grounds of Delaware Valley College, which is specifically an agricultural school. And they were so impressed with the irrigation method they used to grow the corn as fast as they did, most of it involving reclaimed water, that now they teach that method of growing <laughs> corn at that college. That's uh, awesome. Kind of interesting. Now, for some of the big ones, the shoot started on September 12th, 2001, the day after 9-11. That's so insane. Yeah, the cast and crew held a candlelight vigil to basically commemorate the events. Yeah. And then they shot the scene when Mel Gibson talks to his dying wife because that oh. was first 
on their shot list. Oh, man. Yeah. M. Night Shyamalan as Ray Reddy to prepare and to make the film more personal. His grandfather died the day before. Oh. So he kept pictures of his grandfather and photographs of the candlelight vigil on the first day of shooting in his pocket during those scenes. And he actually didn't tell Mel Gibson that he'd be the one playing that role until the camera started rolling. <laughs> really? So, yeah. Man, yeah. okay. It's a weird thing to spring on your lead actor. Yeah. The aliens only barely appear in the film in a couple scenes, and the reason they're only seen in quick glimpses is because he honestly didn't want to show them. His original idea was to do like a Hitchcock yeah. or Spielberg-style suspense where you don't see them, and he didn't want to use CGI, but they couldn't make it work editing-wise without adding them, or at least they thought so they tried at first to create them practically using some motion capture and then partial CGI. And they originally had an actress playing the alien, but ended up switching it to a kind of buffer dude to make an alien because they didn't think it was scary enough. And they ended up doing CGI in those two scenes, both the scene at the birthday party and the scenes at the end where we actually see the alien yeah. because they felt like their practical effects couldn't match it. Uh, but they were never fully happy with how they turned out. I think it's understandable oh. looking back now, but I remember this people were really scared by this movie when I went to see it in like high school or whenever we went. And those are our fun facts. Well, thank you for those fun thank facts, Paige. Fun fact. Let's talk some box office. So what do you guys think the production budget for this movie was? I know, so I will recuse myself. All right, Mikey, you got one shot. What's your guess? 37 million. All right. Uh, you're about halfway there. It was $70 million. It's God, really? Yes. Actually, I have an exact number. It was $70 million, $702,619. That's a lot of money. That's got to be a lot of casting money. I'm sure it is. This movie doesn't have a lot to spend money on. There really aren't many locations. Uh, no. And no. it's all corn in one house. So, mm -hmm. yeah. This movie should not have cost $72 million to make. I think that's ridiculous. Agreed. Give this to a uh, Lee one l It's $8,500 and it looks better. <laughs> um. I, I mean, on, on, honestly... Honestly, that dude knows the value of using a practical effect when you can. I don't yeah. I don't always agree with putting makeup on ghosts the way he and James Wan do. <laughs> but that aside, I would say Conjuring 2 is way scarier than this movie. 100%. All right, so this movie came out on August 2nd, 2002, and it was number one at the box office the weekend it came out. It beat Austin Powers Gold, number was number two that week, Master of Disguise, number three, Martin Lawrence Live was number four, and The Road to Perdition was number five. Ooh, I love that movie. It's a great movie. What do you think Signs made in its first weekend out? First weekend out, I'm going to yep. say 20 mil. All right. No, I think this one's big. I think it's like 80 to 90. You're a little off on either side. It's, it made $60.1 million its first weekend out. I know yeah. what it made overall, so I will recuse myself. From uh, that okay, one. well, that was my next question. So, Mikey, what do you think it made domestically overall while it was in theaters? 130. All right, it made $227.9 million domestically, and then internationally it made $180.2 million. That makes for sense. For a total of $408.2 million. It was a massive hit. A massive it, yeah, really hit, was. I remember. Yeah. So that is your box office. All right, let's do the scary scale. Scary scale is a scale of 1 to 10, how scary we found the film when we watched it today. One example is Ghostbusters. Ten example is Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Page one, <laughs> you were you very clear about it. that. I think, I, I, think, I think we got it. We'll just move on. Uh, Todd, what do you think? I'm gonna give it a six. This movie really shook me last night, it shook me okay. all night long, like ACDC. It was very <laughs> scary. I'm gonna go ahead and give it a four because I was actually, I hadn't <laughs> seen it so long where I, I'd forgotten about the jump scares, and so I was like, ah, oh, I got scared. Yeah, it was very scary. So that's your scary scale, guys. So this week, the listeners made us watch signs. What are you guys making me watch next week? Next week, we're going to be watching Hell House LLC because oh. we thought it would be kind of fun. February is a very romantic month. And so in honor of Mikey, we're making February ghost month this oh, year. Oh, <laughs> man. That's 
such a specifically well thought out low blow. <laughs> so, and honestly, Hell House LLC is one of those that has almost won a listener request, and it's an oft requested movie in the Facebook group. We get comments about Hell House LLC every day, at least one a day. Yeah. Okay. So, one of Paige and I's scariest subgenres of horror is ghost so yeah uh we are still picking movies for the month and i'm not saying we'll have a listener request but like throw suggestions of the scariest ghost movies at us in the in facebook group social media i want to hear all the ghost stories that scare you scare you to death or if you want to just throw in like casper the friendly ghost because you're nice to me Mm-mm. that would be good Mm-mm. too the the best Mm-mm. you're gonna get is amityville so you can look at ryan reynolds honestly yeah i'd suffer through it for rr let's do it <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, so your homework next week is to watch Hell House LLC. So, Mikey, do you have a review for us to read? I don't. Well, while you're looking one up, let me tell them how they can have their review read on the podcast, and then it's simply to leave us a five-star text review, and that way Mikey will have something to read. So, Mikey, who are you going to read today? Abby Gibson says, okay. a hilarious wild ride. Please read in a Jar Jar Binks accent. Oh, no. <laughs> Why? Oh, wow. <laughs> Fuck. And she doesn't even type it like Jar Jar Binks. This is going to be hard. Good. Uh, okay. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a me, Jar Jar? I don't... That's a Mario. It's a That's me. Mario. No, that, is, that is Mario. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. It's a Misa. Misa with Jar Jar. Yes. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's gotcha, a Jar gotcha, Jar, yeah. yeah. Oh, God. Any. Okay. Fuck it up. Oh, wow. Because you're, you're in for a roller coaster of fun. Every single single uh, episode. Uh. Wow, I didn't realize Jar Jar Banks was Italian. <laughs> Todd, <laughs> I, it's been such a long time since I've heard Jar Jar Banks. <laughs> uh, to 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 Mikey and Paige have amazing chemistry, and the rapport between them is always a top of the notch. <laughs> this is a terror. Do you know who Jar Jar Banks is? Me said John Trumpy. They discuss <laughs> the movie plots with enough detail that you can listen even if you've never seen a film. Oh, wow. Okay. Me said, me said John Trumpy. Okay. Uh, the episodes are chock full of information. Fun plot summaries. Uh, uh, fun, fun effects. <laughs> Box office stats. And host insights with. Uh, tons of uh, jokes and uh, a witty, uh, witty C uh, banter peppered <laughs> throughout. How can you make this sound like Jar Jar Binks, Abby? <laughs> okay, <clears throat> don't blame Abby uh, for your shortcomings. The 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 best uh, a part is when they make a joke at each other's expense. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you know they're great friends as well as co-hosts. Aw. Oh, this has become my favorite podcast, and I hope you never stop recording 10 to 10, five stars. Uh, I g- Yay. Misa, give it five stars. <laughs> well, well, Abby Gibson, thank you so much for that that awesome five-star review. And I'm not exactly sure where the line of offensive is, but I'm sure Mikey crossed it somewhere while reading that review. And if you want to have Mikey <laughs> read your review, leave us a five-star review. So, guys, if you like this show but want to hear this power thruple on another movie review show about romance and romantic comedies, check out Romancing the Pod, where Mikey, Paige, and I break down and make fun of romantic movies. It's a lot of fun, guys. Check it out. If you want to follow us on social, please do. We are at Horror Virgin or online at HorrorVirgin.com. If you want to follow us all individually, you can do that as well. Paige is at Paige Wesley on Twitter or Rampage Wesley everywhere else, including TikTok. Mikey is at M Randolph 24 and I am at Todd J Awesome. If you like the show so much and you want to help financially support it, please do by going to patreon.com slash horror virgin where you can get a lot of great levels and a lot of great stuff like bonus episodes, director's cut episodes where they're a little bit longer and you get them actually a day earlier mm-hmm, than the mm-hmm. regular feed drop. We do a lot of great things like listener requests and stuff like that. So guys, check out yeah. the Patreon and help support the show. If you can't financially support the show, that's understandable. That's fine. But if you want to hang out with us on the daily, join the Facebook group uh, at facebook.com slash group slash horror virgin. We also link it like once a week. So just find it there and join the awesome Facebook group. We're closing in on 1600 members. It's amazing. You guys are awesome. And literally we're in there talking every day. It's awesome. And guys, we got a PO box. So if you want to send us some love letters or whatever you might send to a PO box, it's actually not a PO box. It's like a regular street address. It's pretty awesome. It's 
6688 Nolensville Road, number 108-34, Brentwood, Tennessee, 37027. So send us some stuff. Yeah. This episode was brought to you by Nick, Nick B. B. Nick B. Fun fact. Oh, yeah? He uh, got caught doing a crop circle once. Oh, oh yeah? really? How'd they catch him? He was still doing it and they just walked up. Oh, well, I mean, that's how that usually happens. <laughs> I wonder what the legal punishment is for a crop circle in the UK. I think that you have to try and make crop circles make sense within this movie. And <laughs> it could take you, you know, years. One could lose their mind trying to do that mental gymnastics page. Indeed. This episode also brought to you by... Ori! Ori. Uh, and Ori did me a huge favor this week by letting me stay in her basement when aliens attacked. And it turns out it wasn't aliens. I was just, you know, I just sort of cracked up a little bit because I was under a lot of stress or whatever. But I thought aliens were attacking and she just let me stay in her basement. Also, she didn't know I was there and don't tell her. <laughs> <laughs> This episode also brought to you by Awesome Possum Blossom. And Awesome Possum Blossom wants us to give you some awesome possum facts. So here's one for you. Their eyes aren't totally black. One of the possum's most recognizable features is its pair of opaque eyes. Possum's eyes do have whites and irises, but because their pupils are so large, their eyes appear completely black from a distance. The exaggerated pupil dilation is thought to help the nocturnal animals see after the sun goes down. Mm. This episode's also brought to you by Brandon's Bug Business, and that is actually called Bug Cage Company on Facebook. But if you have any tarantula, spider, scorpion, centipede, millipede, or other rapide needs, reach out to Bug Cage Company on Facebook and have them shipped to you, which sounds insane. No, it sounds like, like a good that. practical joke. I didn't know people would actually ship you bugs. I knew of drugs, but not bugs. Mm -mm, don't like this. Mm. <laughs> yeah, this episode's also brought to you by Jeff. He wants to shout out his Kissing Jessica Jones podcast, which is a podcast where they go over uh, each episode of the Jessica Jones show on Netflix. Well, awesome. Guys, check out Kissing Jessica Jones on your favorite podcast app, especially if you like Jessica Jones and or Kissing Jessica Jones. We now return you to another episode of uh, The, the Patriotical. Okay, so uh, I think the last episode, everybody was fighting my dog, Macy, the evil dog. Yes. Head of the Illuminati. Yeah. Uh, so um, Macy starts coughing. Okay. And she, like, throws up. And she throws up Dave. <laughs> okay. And Dave comes out, and he's like, that dog ate me, and I that's where I've been. <laughs> that's where Dave went? Uh-huh. But he's like, I'm okay, because I grew back, and then she had to throw me up. Well, yeah, because Dave is the one that... It gets killed every episode and then comes back. And then Maisie said, like a dirty sock, I will eat you up again. And he, she bites into him and throws him. And then she, he hits Kate, knocks her down, and her, breaks her telekinesis concentration. Wait, what? Yeah. You mean just this once or she's no longer able to do telekinetic stuff? Just this once. She's okay. knocked unconscious. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Isaac was like, fuck this shit, I'm out. I'm so tired of this storyline of the Patreonicals that <laughs> I am not going to fight the Illuminati anymore. And he's like, who's going to go with me? And, <laughs> and Evil Matthew was like, totally. I don't like half of these people. I am evil. Look at the goatee. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they're like, Karun, do you want to go since you're an alien and like your friends hate you or whatever? And he's still crying. Uh, and... Uh, that you're not welcome back in space and he was like yeah i guess i i think i have a like a wikipedia on my phone with advanced technology that i could share with y'all or whatever so like <laughs> they take off uh eddie has talked the koalas into coming back over into their team and uh the, the koalas attack macy uh tristam um is crawling but his arm has got chewed off and he's like leaking oil or whatever That's yeah it's words. robot blood oil that makes sense yeah yeah. And then uh, Sasha, Sasha speaks up and she's like, I've analyzed this uh, situation. I think we can get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> After much analyzing, it's time to fucking go. Yeah. And then she has become best friends with Amy, the astronaut. That makes sense. And um, they were like, yeah, let's let's go. So they, they pick up Kate and w they wake her up and she uses her telekinesis to uh, move uh, Tristam and Dave's body. And they they take off running and basically uh, is being killed by the the koala so she's eating all the koalas that's the last they say is they they run away some more it's like an extended chase with my dog chasing them and trying to kill them but uh they've split into two people now two groups yeah and then uh amy was like let's head out to there's an air base around here i think uh because i'm was in the air force because i'm an astronaut so let's go there and uh, 
Kate's like, yes, but she's like very weak. So that's where they're headed. And then uh, Isaac and evil Matthew and Karun are headed somewhere else. Uh, they haven't made their minds up yet, but they found a car. Okay. What will happen to our heroes as our two groups start to separate? Is Mikey just a little too specific with what Macy's been doing to our heroes that it has to be the way she tortures him every day? If Isaac's group drives away at 60 miles an hour, but Kate's group flies away at 300 miles an hour, who understands what's going on sooner? <laughs> Find out next week on another episode of The, the Patreonicals. Patreonicals. That's going to be it for us, you guys. I'm Paige. And I'm Mikey. And I'm your horror virgin Todd, guys. Keep it ooky spooky. Have an amazing week. Bye. Bye. Alien nerds. Keep swinging. <laughs> God. <laughs>